Hello everyone. Good morning, Shopadale, Tashidale. Oh, that was a little too soon. So, before I begin anything, I want to begin with a disclaimer. Please do not be misled by my robes. I have no wisdom to share. Just some thoughts, experiences, and show stories. Just to set the expectations clear, that's also me. This is also me. So you're clear about who you're interacting or who I'm interacting with. With all the introduction and, you know, the promotional material you must have come across, which says that I'm a transgender, non-binary person, a Buddhist monastic. You might be still wondering what it even means, and that's okay. I rarely meet people in my life who don't have an urge to kind of give a label to me, fit into me some kind of box. As much as they are compelled to do that, they also find it very difficult. With most of the identities that are imposed on me, and many that I claim myself, one of the labels that I comfortably go with and go with all my identities is that I'm a friend. It might sound corny at this point, but just bear with me to explain what I'm trying to tell. Like most trans people, queer people, I do not have a sense of connection with my family or the immediate social settings I was born into. And as much as that was a challenge, it was also an opportunity for me to think about relationships. Relationships that I was born into and relationships I choose to get into. Although most of the relationships that I seem to have actively and willingly participated or relied on are friendships. Growing up in school, the only friends I had were the ones who were bullied with me. We had a sense of affinity in our shared suffering and also the ignorance of not knowing what's happening and why it is happening. This friendship was born out of necessity to survive and also willingness to find strength with each other. It lasted as long as it did, and I'm thankful about that. With all the labels that were given to me back then, such as not normal, effeminate, kodja, cheka, one of them was also that so-and-so friend, or friend of so-and-so person. A little bit fast forward into life, somehow I made to college, got into a course that was not of my parents' liking. Although it was a course of my interest, the lack of sense of belonging followed me into the college. And I had to sort it out elsewhere again. And most of it I seeked out in my community work while entering with various organizations. Whatever my community work today might seem like, most of it is for these friendships that helped me make sense of the world. It did not take me much of a time to realize that most of this community work is also anchored in the friendships. For me, a 18-year-old person right into the college, even to have a sense of belonging in that part of the world, was possible because of a friendship offered to me by a person who was 20 years older to me. Let me try and give you an example of what I'm trying to say. One, that these friendships helped me see the world, and also these friendships gave me the safety and nurturance that I needed. These friendships also gave me the confidence to come to terms with my own marginalized identities as a queer person, as a trans person, and also in turn helped me engage and work with the communities. So to share with you the example or a small story, I was in early 20s, just began working with the queer community and LGBT community at that point. And it was also the time when Supreme Court of India reinstated Section 377, criminalizing queer relationships, striking down 2009 Delhi High Court judgment. Around that time, there's a trans man from a village in Telangana who reached out to me via phone, saying that he and his partner had to run away from home because his partner was being forced into marriage against her wishes. 
I consulted with a couple of friends and said, okay, you could come to Hyderabad, we will support you. In the process of leaving home, they left one of their phone behind with my number in it. And of course, eventually a complaint and my phone number reached the police station there. And with collaboration with some women's police station in Hyderabad, the police contacted me saying, what is my relationship with the girl and where she is? Thanks to Section 377 being back in the picture, I could no more say that I'm a queer person simply and these are transgender, cisgender couple who you know, have run away out of their own wish. So I had to find a different scenario of dealing with the issue, looking at it, oh, this is an adult, young adult woman who is being forced against her wishes into a marriage. So I need an affiliation of a women's organization to work with, not as a queer person, but as someone who works for, as a feminist, as a women's rights activist. So one organization I reached out at that point was unfamiliar with queer rights, unfamiliar with LGBT terrain of work, but we had solidarity in our shared beliefs. And that solidarity eventually grew up to be a friendship that we all share even today in Hyderabad among women's organizations and LGBT community. Well, you all must be thinking, what happened to the couple? Yeah, no suspenses. We worked coordinatedly, got the case quashed, found a job for one of the partner through other friendships and they went on to live. So as I'm in a storytelling mode, I'll also tell you one more story. Soon after college, I worked in a public university for a year. After that, I moved on to work in corporate for a very brief time. And then I ended up at a feminist research organization as a re uh, with a fellowship. One of my co-fellow, was a Dalit student activist and leader in the university where I studied. For me, coming from a privileged oppressor caste family, I was just trying to understand and learn caste dynamics and politics and issues in the country. And for my co-fellow, I'm the first queer person to engage and work with day in and day out. This was also time when I started wearing saris didn't make situation any easier. But it's also the time when Telangana state formed. So we queer people were also figuring out what does this new state mean to us? How do we engage with the community? How do we educate people? How do we work with police? So on and so forth. As that discussion was happening, one queer collective decided they wanted to do a flash mob, a queer flash mob in Hyderabad. We were all figuring out way to do, how to do it and all. And we all thought, okay, why not Usmania University, the ground of Telangana movement? That brought me, that took me back to my co-fellow, ask, oh, is this a possibility? What seemed like an impossible idea back then, thanks to this friend, we did not only do the queer flash mob in Hyderabad, but we did it in front of the iconic Usmania University Arts College building. This friend also went on to write a song on lives of Hijra people. This friend also helped us organize protests. This friend also helped us release autobiography of a trans woman in Telugu in university campus. He also helped us to flag of the first Telangana queer Swabhimana Kavatu, which globally you would know as Pride March in Hyderabad by Professor Kanchayalaya, establishing an alliance between Dalit Bahujan movement and LGBT rights movement in Telangana, setting a different tone of pride marches in the entire country. This friendship was thanks to him because there was space from the beginning for both of us to say, I don't know. And this friendship was built on that. Well, I mean, So you all must, one thing you all might find interesting or more curious about me than whatever I'm sharing is that my saris and my robes. So I'll talk a little bit about that also. Growing up, I don't remember, till now I don't remember ever feeling being comfortable being placed in gender binary, within the binary of male and female. I transgressed the gender that was assigned to me at birth many times, I continue to do, through my associations, expressions, actions. I also got punished by it. 
punished for it by my family, peers, other systems and structures I was part of. It took me some, you know, before even getting to the question of gender and so on and so forth, I always knew I had a longing for saris. It took me some roughly 20 years to kick out the label gender out of saris and embrace them as my own, to realize that clothes, like work, like many other things, doesn't have gender. So I started wearing saris. Of course, I couldn't do it from the place where I was staying, my parents' home. I had to set up a wardrobe in my office where I was working. I was the only queer trans person in the office filled with cisgender heterosexual people in their 40s and 50s. I certainly didn't have a language to articulate what I was doing. And they barely had any clue what I'm doing. But nonetheless, all the women in the office took turns in teaching me how to drape a sari to begin with. My boss and mentor took me shopping. We shopped jewelry, saris, all that. While all this was happening, me in sari shook many of my relationships. Of course, my parents, without saying, they got very angry because I also showed myself up in TVs and newspapers, me in sari, which was not easy in a middle class, upper middle class family. And as much as family got angry, it is also my cisgender heterosexual friends as well as cis gay friends who decided not to hang out with me because they couldn't deal with all the ogling I would receive in the public spaces. I don't need to tell you about the larger world. I was denied entry into metro stations, refused to be checked at the malls, catcalling, soliciting for sex work, quoting how much of amount I would charge. All that has happened. While the larger world's interaction with me changed, I was grasping to figure out what it is. While all this was happening, I was able to help myself together because my mentor ensured there is space in our friendship and in the organization for my despair, for my hopelessness, for my trauma, for confusion and chaos and for uncertainty. Moving on from this comfortable, unconventional friendship, I decided, oh, I'll, it's time for me to uproot myself and become a Buddhist monastic something I thought growing up I would be monastic. So I got ordained in Himachal, Palampur, and my teacher asked me to go to Bihar, Bodh Gaya. So I went to Bodh Gaya, Bihar, not knowing anything about the community I'm walking into. I wasn't sure if this community has space for my queerness and transness. But one thing I was sure was that I was not going back into the closet. I was not hiding it. So whenever there were opportunities, I did talk about my gender, my sexuality, as openly as frankly possible. Most of the times it was met with same openness by fellow nuns mostly. Recently one of my nun friends has put me in touch with uh, another nun I've never met. So this friend of mine told her that, talk to Tashi Anila. Anila is a phrase used to address nuns in Tibetan. As much as I'm sharing these stories with you all, as much as nostalgic I feel about it. This is not about just my own personal experience. This is not just about uh, you know, my spiritual and political journey so far. This is about the friendships that we all travel with, knowingly and unknowingly. Some of the friendships are obvious. Some are really unexpected. It is these friendships that helped me survive and thrive. As a queer person, trans person, I'm not saying these friendships are unique as such, but these are so important to me that they are whole of my life. I can, I can map my entire life on these friendships. I can, you know, take comfort in those friendships. For a queer and trans person like me, these friendships are all of my life. Like most queer trans people, I don't have a strong substantial ties, uh, connections with my natal family. These friendships are all that I have. Not to undermine the struggle of being a trans person in the world, but it is my queerness and transness that gave me the possibility to think of these friendships, to have belief in them, to have rely on them, 
to have reliance on them. I believe that these friendships, whether queer or not, we all need them. Friendships that nurture us, friendships that protect us, friendships that challenge us, that empower us, friendships that are with us to go through in our life the fun and morbidity of it. That brings also to me think about cisgender heterosexual people. One of my family member, from natal family member, who is a cisgender heterosexual woman, I've seen her all her life growing up, her life revolving around family, family, family. It is either family or nothing else. There was no scope for any other friendships. And I've seen what it did to her and does to her. And I so wish that was not the case. Unlike, although we all aspire this friendship, our unquestionable faith and belief in the norms, in the notions that seem to be set in stone and unchangeable, we still continue to think families that are natal by birth or families by marriage are the only source or the only way of having reliable, healthy, stable relationships. Friendships somehow become the backup plan, the secondary relationships. Unlike any other relationships, in fact, friendships don't have a blueprint. All other relationships have a defined role. Parents, children, neighbors, colleagues, they have defined set roles in place. But all the friendships are unique by themselves. They are not fixed in stone. There is fluidity that gives freedom. They are groundless yet grounding. Friendships are liberating. There is space for not knowing, there is space for change, there is space for non-conformity, there is space for change, growth, chaos, all of that. We queer people seek, as queer trans person and my fellow queer trans people, we seek refuge in friendships not because we mastered them, but because that is our only source of refuge. As much as we offer queer the cisgender world, a lot of other things to think about, we also offer these friendships and a hope and a glimmer towards it, that these friendships are possible. So much of queerphobia and transphobia, as much as it is to do with who we have sex with, our gender transgressions, I think it is also because queer people and communities present possibility of a friendship that challenges the majoritarian, normal, popular understanding of love, companionship, and communion. Imagine a world where there is no one who expected to have, you know, hierarchical engagement with relationships. Parents come here, children come here, partner comes here. Where there is no sacrosanct understanding of one kind of family. Where there is no, you know, laws, policies, housing loans, family breathing down your neck, telling get married. Would we still think about relationships and friendships in the same way as we do now? Something to think about. In short, I am my friendships. In fact, what all that I've shared here today, the inspiration and guidance of that is from a friendship. I'll, end, I'll leave you with a quote by Venerable Tichnathan, who is fondly known as Thai by everyone. This body of mine will disintegrate, but my actions will continue me. If you think I am only this body, then you have not really seen me. When you look at my friends, you see my continuation. Thank you. <laughs>